Hey, it's Dr. Sarah Gottfried, and I want to talk today about hormone therapy. I want to talk about estrogen, a little bit about what it does before you go through perimenopause and menopause, and then some of the controversy that we have around hormone therapy. And this is probably going to be a series of videos because it's very hard to cram in all of the complex thinking about this situation into a single video. Um, but I'm going to try to cram in what I can. So we're still in quarantine. One of the things I'm doing in quarantine is I'm still teaching. So I have a group of um, people that I'll be teaching on Thursday this week in um, an advanced cardiovascular medicine course. And I'm really excited about that because I'm giving a talk for three hours on women, hormones, and cardiovascular disease. So let me just start with a quick caveat, which is I'm a gynecologist. So I went to medical school in 1989. I saw my first patient that year because Harvard Medical School has you see patients pretty early. But I didn't start prescribing hormone therapy to women until later. So that started more in my internship, which began in 1994. So I've been doing this kind of work, thinking about the female body, thinking about hormones, thinking about some of the risks that women face. So the big ones are cardiovascular disease, breast cancer, stroke, osteoporosis. There's a long list of some of the things that we face when we go through perimenopause and menopause. Um, and what I wanna talk about first is the role of estrogen and here I'm mostly talking about estradiol, in the female body. And it's interesting because if you just take cardiovascular disease and you look at what happens to men versus what happens to women, we know that women tend to develop cardiovascular disease later than men. So there's about a 10-year lag when you look at uh, myocardial infarction, when you look at coronary heart disease, there's a 10-year lag. When you look at high blood pressure, for instance, women tend to have lower blood pressure until they go through perimenopause and menopause, and then they catch up to men. But the problem is a lot of the research looks at women compared to men in randomized trials. That's considered the best quality evidence. And then they adjust for sex. Are you male or female? And what you can see is that it's a much more complex situation than just adjusting for sex. So what's different between men and women? There's a lot of things. Certainly sex hormones are different. Men tend to have more testosterone, but women have testosterone too. In fact, it's the most abundant hormone that we have. Women have more estradiol compared to men, but men have it too. So it's not quite as simple as the black and white that you often read about in books or hear about on the media. We also know that women go through menarche, so they start menstruating. That's the difference in puberty. We go through pregnancy and the postpartum period, the fourth trimester. We go through perimenopause and menopause. And we have these subtle hormonal changes that occur throughout our lives. And those can confer some risk. So I, I recorded a video previously about how pregnancy is a stress test. And when you look at women, you look at their cardiovascular risk factors, you wanna go way beyond just the, the usual five that we pay attention to. And I'll put that the details on that in the post. There's more than 400 known risk factors for cardiovascular disease. And we have to be paying attention to all those 400. So many of them occur in pregnancy that's when you can unmask some endothelial dysfunction, dysfunction at the level of the blood vessel. And it's really important to pay attention to that. So let's talk about some of the effects of estrogen in the body. I just um, made a new slide today on this particular topic. So I wanna share um, the 20 papers that I read on this particular topic. So, we believe that estrogen is cardioprotective. And as I said, I'm talking primarily about the estradiol, 
which is the form of estrogen that women have most abundantly through our reproductive years. So what does estradiol do? It increases nitric oxide bioavailability, so it helps with dilation of blood vessels. It's also, um, we know that it improves your lipids, your cholesterol numbers. It's anti-inflammatory, it's antiplatelet, it's an antioxidant. It's also anti-apoptotic. Uh, that's kind of a fancy word. So apoptosis is programmed cell death, and estrogen helps to regulate and modulate cell death so that it occurs when it should and not prematurely, um, and also uh, doesn't get out of control, as is what happens in cancer. What else does it do? It prevents arterial stiffening, which is one of those factors that we see in women after they go through menopause. It's anti-atherogenic, and so it does that few, uh, via a couple of mechanisms, including inhibiting monocyte adhesion to vascular endothelium, and that's uh, via neural cell adhesion molecules. That's a little bit more basic science than you probably want. But the last thing is it regulates microRNA. And this is something to pay attention to. I think microRNA is super interesting and something that we're gonna be hearing a lot more about in the next 10 years. So those are some of the effects of the estrogen, the estradiol that you have in your body up until that final menstrual period. Now, one of the things that happened with women, and this is part of our shameful past, is that we really pushed hormone therapy on women for perimenopausal and menopausal symptoms. And we did that before we had a randomized trial to show that it was safe. So instead we had observational data, we had preclinical data, meaning that it was in animal studies. We had a lot of data that showed that estrogen was cardioprotective and that you have to give progesterone to counter the effects of estrogen at the level of the endometrium and prevent endometrial cancer and hyperplasia. The studies that we collected, including the Nurses Health Study, showed that women who took hormone therapy had about half the risk of cardiovascular disease as women who didn't take hormone therapy. But the problem was, this was the Nurses Health Study. It was a a very large observational study of nurses. And it turns out that the women who took hormone therapy were different than the women who didn't take hormone therapy. They tended to be healthier, they saw their doctors more, they were wealthier, they got more screening tests. And so two different populations. So hormone therapy was prescribed. The number one prescription in the US for much of this time was Premarin, conjugated equine estrogen, which is derived from pregnant Mary urine, together with a form of progestin that I do not prescribe anymore called medroxyprogesterone acetate. So these two synthetic hormones were very commonly prescribed and we, we even prescribed estrogen therapy for 59 years before a randomized trial was done. So the first randomized trial, I wanna talk about two randomized trials today. The first randomized trial was the HERS trial. And that was published in 1998, 1999. Uh, Deb Grady was one of the lead researchers at UCSF. And they were looking at a group of women who had active cardiovascular disease. These were women who had on average uh, an age of 67. And so these women were given conjugated equine estrogen and medroxyprogesterone acetate, and they were followed. And what they found was that they had an increased risk of cardiovascular events. That's not very surprising in someone who is so many years away from menopause. The average age of menopause is 51. So looking at women who had an average age of 67 and had established cardiovascular disease, they found in the first year of treatment with the devils we know, conjugated equine estrogen, medroxyprogesterone acetate, that it increased cardiac events. It increased myocardial infarction, it increased angina, and it also increased blood clots, also known as um, ven venous thromboembolism. 
So that wasn't very surprising, but it was a randomized trial that showed that in women who have heart disease already, it's dangerous and provocative to give them estrogen together with progestin. So that was important, but then it led to another randomized trial and Bernadine Healy was the head of this one. This was a very large, expensive randomized trial where they took a large group of women Average age this time of 63. So they were all ages from 50 to 79, mean age 63. And they were supposedly free of cardiovascular disease. Now I'm gonna dispute that in a minute, but the Women's Health Initiative in the first year of treatment, they had two arms. One arm was uh, women who had a hysterectomy and they were given conjugated equine estrogen. The other arm was women who did not have a hysterectomy, so they had a uterus, and they were given conjugated equine estrogen together with medroxyprogesterone acetate, and then there was a placebo arm. And what they found is that in the first year of treatment, these women had increased events, increased cardiovascular events. So similar to the HERS trial, we now have two randomized trials showing the same result but when those initial results came out from the Women's Health Initiative in 2002, they did not stratis stratify by age. And they did not talk about how many years these women were from menopause. So I just wanna take a moment to talk about how these women that were in the HERS trial and also in the Women's Health Initiative are very different than the women that I treat with hormone therapy. So what do we know about them? Well, they were trying to get women who were not symptomatic of menopausal symptoms. They weren't having hot flashes and difficulty sleeping and a decreased libido because they knew that if you then randomize those women to receive estrogen versus placebo, that they were going to know which treatment arm they were in. So they tried to, to make sure that they were collecting participants who were further out from menopause and weren't having much in the way of symptoms. So overall, fewer than 10% of the women in the Women's Health Initiative were symptomatic. Now that's the first problem because why would you treat those women? If I have a patient who's not symptomatic of menopause, I'm not gonna give her hormone therapy. So that's the first problem. There's many of them. So we know that 70% of the women who were in the Women's Health Initiative were overweight or obese, 70%. That's pretty high. So that's a body mass index of 50 or higher. And that alone confers some increased risk in terms of insulin signaling and metabolic health. 50% were current or past cigarette smokers. So they already have some endothelial damage just by virtue of being past smokers or current smokers. More than 35% of these women were hypertensive, meaning they had high blood pressure requiring treatment. And if we take a step back for a moment and we just look at the way that we treat hypertension, we've now changed to a much more intensive approach where we start to treat women and men at an earlier systolic and diastolic blood pressure than we did when the WHI was performed. So, Many of these women already had vascular dysfunction as evidenced not only by the smoking status or being overweight and obese, but by their blood pressure. Only 10% of the women were aged 50 to 54. And I would say the age group where I focus on hormone therapy tends to be women who are 45 to 55. Now, occasionally I'll have some women who are a little bit older than that, who are say 55 to 60, and I'll be treating them with hormone therapy and we'll have a conversation about how we're getting kind of to the edge of the data that we have from the Women's Health Initiative. But, you know, for the most part, the women that I'm treating are 45 to 55. So very few of those were represented in the Women's Health Initiative. 70% were between the ages of 60 and 79. 70%. And that's the age where you see atherosclerotic plaques. So of course they had increased events. So the conclusion from all of this is that 
Vascular dysfunction, a problem in the blood vessels, together with atherosclerosis, was already present in these patients, even though this study was designed to be primary prevention of cardiovascular disease. If you look at this broader picture of risk factors, the 400 risk factors that we want to be considering, we know that many of these women in WHI had those risk factors already. So what we have to do is we have to take these design flaws that occurred in the HERS trial in the, the Women's Health Initiative and realize that, okay, there's some things that we can conclude in terms of giving women hormone therapy that are uh, more than 10 or 20 years from menopause, but we cannot take this data and generalize it to younger women. So we cannot generalize it to all women. We can only generalize it to the older women that were studied in these two studies, these two trials. And we also can't generalize what we know about the hormone therapy that was used, conjugated equine estrogen and medroxyprogesterone acetate, as I call them, the devils we know. We can't apply that to all forms of hormone therapy. So I prescribe bioidentical hormone therapy. The way that I like to do it is I like to use transdermal estradiol. I prefer to use FDA approved forms of estradiol. So I like to use a patch or I like to use a gel. And then I like to give oral progesterone because that's what's been studied the most and we know is safe in terms of cardiovascular disease. I'll sometimes use transvaginal progesterone because we do have endometrial safety with it, but we don't have a lot of cardiovascular events with transvaginal progesterone. So that's what I tend to prescribe. I do not use transdermal progesterone in women who have a uterus. As a gynecologist, I don't think that's safe. We don't, although once again, lack of proof is not proof against. So we need to have more data showing safety before I'm willing to prescribe it. So I just wanted to give you a sense of kind of the historical pr perspective when it comes to hormone therapy. The HERS trial and the Women's Health Initiative, they told us a lot of important things, but not so much that we can generalize to younger women. The way that I tend to approach hormone therapy in women is that you've got this window of time. It's called the critical window. And I believe for both cardiovascular disease and also for brain health, that that critical window is probably five years from menopause. So I tend to start patients with hormone therapy if we make a decision based on a really complex data analysis that they are candidates for hormone therapy and they want it. So given all those caveats, if we decide to start it, it's gonna be in those women who are basically 45 to 55. And once you get beyond 55, we have to really question whether that's a good idea. We have to look at the history for those 400 risk factors, including what happened in pregnancy, did that unmask some endothelial dysfunction like with preeclampsia or with a uh, small for gestational age baby or um, even preterm labor, gestational diabetes? Do you have some of those risk factors that are gonna put you at a greater risk if we start hormone therapy? So it's a, it's a very complex analysis that I do with my patients. And what I wanna do in the next video is talk about some of the other randomized trials and also re-stratification that has been done from those two large randomized trials that we have, HERS and WHI. So I hope this has been helpful. Um, I love talking about hormone therapy because I think it's one of those topics that really gets us to look at the female body in all of its glory and kind of understand, okay, what's the right amount of estradiol? Before perimenopause, to optimize pregnancy, to optimize the postpartum period, to optimize bone strength and heart health, breast health. How do we integrate all of these different concepts and then help a woman who's in perimenopause and symptomatic or freshly menopausal and symptomatic? How do we help her going forward? So I hope that this has been helpful. I'll keep churning out these videos as I get closer to my presentation uh, in cardiovascular health. Thanks for joining me.